We're in Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 16 this morning. Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 16. We're going to talk about God's perfect purpose of compassion. The entire book of Jonah really has to do with the compassion of God. And, and that's what we are learning as we work our way through this book over the next few weeks. Now, last week when we started the book, we talked about how we need to know who the author was, right, in the, in the background of the text. Because remember, the text only means what it always meant, right? We're, we're not going to make this text say something it never said before, right? What it, mean, what it meant to the original recipients, it still means today. We're not trying to discover some new revelation today. <laughs> We're, we're discovering some revelation that has been around for thousands of years. Praise God, right? This is what God revealed to his people. So who were the original recipients? We did not talk a lot about that last week other than to say that the original recipients were of the northern kingdom. So let's have a little background here this morning. Remember, God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, correct? And he said, I will make a great nation out of you. And he does. And eventually, Jacob's sons go down into Egypt, and they, eventually the nation becomes enslaved in Egypt. And God redeems his people out of Egypt, brings them to Mount Sinai, gives them the law, brings them through the desert. They wander 40 years because of disobedience and brings them into the land through Joshua, right? Leading them into the land. And then they, they go through a time of judges ruling, Right? And then they come to the time of kings, and they say, we want a king. And so they look for the tall, handsome man named Saul, right? He looks like a king. We want, and so God anoints Saul to be the king. And then you have David, and then we have David's son Solomon. And after Solomon, the kingdom splits in half. The northern kingdom does not want to submit to Solomon's son. And so they, they rebel against, and against the, the, the king of Judah, king of Jerusalem, and they, they create their own little kingdom, and they create their own capital in Samaria. And this is where Jonah's from, is up in the northern kingdom. This is who Jonah writes his prophecy to. This book is written to them. So who are Israel? Who, who are these people? Who is Israel? I guess a better way to say that. And so we need to know who is Israel here. Who are the recipients? So that's so important, the northern kingdom of Israel. And first of all, we need to know what were they called to? What was Israel called to? They were called to worship God, weren't they? Worship the one true God. In fact, the first commandment is to have no other gods but God alone, right? Worship him and him alone. And that was their call, to worship God as his people. And in that, they would represent God to the nations. I think sometimes the, 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 the modern-day church doesn't understand the purpose of Israel. We, we think that people had to come into Israel to go to heaven. No, you did not have to become an Israelite to go to heaven. You had to believe God, right? Right? Believed God, Abraham believed God, and that belief was credited to him for righteousness. Abraham was made righteous by God the same way we are made righteous by God, through faith, right? Amen. God has always worked through faith to save people. That's how he's chosen to do this. And so that was the purpose of Israel, to teach the nations that God is the one they must trust in, that God is the one they must have their hope in. And they were to proclaim that through worshiping God that would proclaim to the nations around them. And they, 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 their activity actually betrays this idea. They didn't understand, or maybe they did understand, but they didn't live out their calling. So what was the activity of Israel that reveals that? Well, first of all, we see that they lay claim to being God's people. Is that a wrong thing, by the way? No, that was right. <laughs> they were God's people. They were called, they were chosen to be God's people. And they laid claim to that. And they had rightful claim to that, didn't they? Here's the problem. 
is that although they laid claim to being God's people, they felt superior to the nations around them because of their claim. Now, were the Israelites superior to the nations around them? No. Does God love Israelites and Ninevites, right? Clearly, from Jonah, God loves Ninevites too. The Israelites were not superior, but they had this, I guess maybe today we'd call it nationalism, that they were superior, and, and you've probably seen that. Now, let me ask a question. Is it wrong to be patriotic? No. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm thankful I live in a country that has freedom, right? It is not wrong to be patriotic, to love our country, be thankful that God has chosen to bless our country. But we must be careful that we don't all of a sudden think, so since God has blessed America the way he has chosen and seen fit, that that makes us superior to Canada, to Mexico, to, to countries in Africa or Europe or Asia, right? We ought to be very careful that we don't suddenly think we are better because God has blessed us. And we can fall into that trap, can't we? And there are those in our nation that have, actually, and fall into this trap of thinking, well, because we're Americans, we are better than everybody else. No, no, we're not. God has seen fit to have his grace and mercy upon our lives and upon our country. And, and, and despite, by the way, our sinfulness in many areas, God has still seen fit to say, I will bless this nation for now. And we don't know what God has in store, Right? And, but our response should not be, well, that makes us better. But that was Israel's response too, wasn't it? They're better than the other people. They don't deserve what we have. We got the grace of God in our lives. The church can fall into this where suddenly we start to think we're better than the world around us. We're not. We might be chosen by God, but he didn't choose us because we're better. Where did God find you? Dead in your trespasses and sins. That's where he found you. He didn't find you because he, you deserve something, okay? We need to understand that, not just as Americans, but as, as the church. And out of that, not only did they feel superior, but they developed a hatred for nations around them. When you start to get a superiority complex, you start to despise those around you. And I, I, I think that's clearly what has happened with some, not, not all, but some who practice this nationalism. They go beyond patriotism to thinking they're better, and suddenly they despise the nations around them, the people from there. We need to caution ourselves against it, but Israel was steeped in that. They hated the nations around them. You see this when Jonah is commanded to go to Nineveh, and where does he go? He goes off to Tarshish, right? He goes the opposite direction. Why? Because he hates those people. He hates them. And part of that hatred comes from the idea that we have Yahweh. We lay claim to being the chosen people of God, so we're better than they are. That was their attitude. They also worshipped other gods. Now, you may find that ironic that they worshipped other gods. Wait a minute, I thought they laid claim to God as God. They did, while they continued to worship other gods. They lay claim to being God's chosen people, to God being their God, while they were continually worshiping other gods too. See, the problem in Israel was not that they tried to replace God with other gods. The problem with Israel was they tried to add gods to Yahweh. They came into the land and they said, well, let's hedge our bets. Baal is a god in Canaan. And he's, he, was here, he was here under the former Canaanites, so we should probably give a little honor to Baal, Right? And maybe Asherah, and maybe Moloch, and, and let's give honor to these other gods. We'll just hedge our bets because these gods are gods of prosperity, and maybe we'll prosper in the land better if we worship the, the land or the gods of this land. And God said, I'm the one that brought you into this land. I'm the one that promised this land. I'm the one that will prosper you. And only by obeying me, by the way, in Deuteronomy did he say, only by obeying me will you remain in this land and be blessed in this land. And they went off and worshipped other gods. And in that, they were disobedient to God. They, they refused to obey the commands of God. Yet they still laid claim to their position as the chosen ones of God. Very dangerous place to be. And these are the recipients of the book of Jonah. And so understanding that can help us understand what God is trying to communicate to these recipients through his prophet Jonah as he shares this narrative. So let's look at the text, John, or sorry, John Jonah, 
Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 16. Let's just start in verse 7. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now I'm taking a little bit of liberty with what the sailors are doing here, okay? Because they're, they're, they are casting lots. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is of the Lord. God is in charge of what happens in everything, even casting a lot. You can think of casting lots, they would probably be stones with marks on them or something like that, and they turn up certain ways. You can think of maybe as dice, you know, if you were to roll the highest roller wins, right? And so you roll the dice, and you know what? Every decision is of the Lord. God's in charge of that. He is. And, and as I look this up, casting lots, it, one, per, one author, uh, theologian, said it's a pagan ritual. Well, we do find, actually, that Christians and believers were casting lots. In fact, when Judas Iscariot was no longer a disciple, he had killed himself, right? And they decide we need a replacement. What they do? They cast lots. And it lot fell on Matthias, and Matthias became the disciple that replaced Judas. But here's one thing to remember. After that, we don't see the casting of lots anymore in Scripture. That's interesting. The casting of lots existed in Scripture many times before that, but after that it does not exist. Why? Well, the text never says why, but I believe it's because we have the Holy Spirit today. Shortly after that, the day of Pentecost comes and the Holy Spirit indwells believers. And you know what? To discover the will of God, we don't need to cast lots anymore. God himself has made us his temple. He is near to us and he speaks with us. We need to cast lots to discover the will of God. You know what we need to do to discover the will of God? Get in his word. Ask him. He reveals it to us, doesn't he? And he does. We're supposed to walk in faith. So casting lots. Now, it's every decision is of the Lord, but I am not under any impression that at this point, at least in the story, the mariners know that they're seeking the will of God. (laughs) I mean, they're casting lots probably just... Any God who's in charge of lots, please show us what's going on, right? <laughs> so they, they, aren't, they don't realize that they're really seeking the will of God, but in a sense they are. Yet what is Jonah in the middle of doing? Here are these heathen mariners are seeking the will of God through casting lots while Jonah is off seeking his own will. That's he's in the middle of running from the presence of God to disobey the command of God. See, God's will is that Jonah goes and tells the Ninevites, I'm going to judge you. And Jonah's will is, no, (laughs) I don't want to. So I'm going the other way, right? That's Jonah's will. And so Jonah is in the middle of pursuing his will. And if we were to look at Jonah as a type or a character that represents Israel, because he does, right? Is Jonah a prophet of Israel? Yes, he is. So he represents the nation of Israel. And Jonah is outside of the will of God as the prophet of God, by the way. And yet, here the mariners, the heathens, are the ones seeking the will of God. Do you see that juxtaposition there? Jonah should have been the one seeking the will of God. Jonah should have been the one saying, what's God want in this? It's the mariners that do so. And moving on, we see that the mariners demonstrate their fear of the Lord. Let's look at that. Verse 8, then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So a lot falls on Jonah. They're, 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 they're inquiring, what's going on here? You know something, right? <laughs> the lot fell on you. You must know what's going on. You tell us. And so Jonah gives them a very succinct, he doesn't answer every question, does he? But he gives them a very succinct response. He says, I am a Hebrew And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They they, they inquire of Jonah, tell us what's going on here. Tell us what's going on. And when Jonah says, hey... I serve the Lord. 
the God of heaven, the one who made the land and the sea. And the response of these mariners are, what have you done? (laughs) Right? What have you done? Why? Because they knew he was fleeing from his presence. The mariners are afraid. They are exceedingly afraid because they recognize the God of all things. I mean, our gods didn't bring this. Your God did. And our gods have never done anything like this. It's amazing. And and you're fleeing that God? And you say he made the land and the sea. Where did you think you were going to (laughs) go? I mean, in my whole life, I guess I've been in an airplane. I've been in the air maybe. But other than that, I've been on the land or I've been on the sea. <laughs> That's all there is, right? And by the way, it says the Lord God who, who is God of heaven, right? So even when I've been in the air, I'm where he is. I can't flee from his presence. And they recognize it. You can't flee from his presence. What have you done? What's the matter with you? <laughs> That's really kind of what there is. What is wrong with you? We might have that response to someone when we see them get off track right? And we know, whoa, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You ever ask that to your children? What are you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? I got asked that a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> and, and the usual response was, I guess I wasn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> or I at least wasn't thinking very deeply. But their response is that they fear the Lord. While Jonah professes fear of the Lord, doesn't he? I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. Really? That idea of fear is to have reverence for, to give awe to, to worship, to trust in, to hope in. Jonah, you are running away from the presence of the Lord, and you want to tell me that you fear the Lord? What? Does Jonah fear the Lord? At least his actions don't say so, do they? But he is willing to profess fear of the Lord. You ever found yourself there? I remember seeing a guy once who was drunk, like stumbling drunk, and he was talking about how God is in charge. God is in control. And I'm like looking at him going, shh. <laughs> Stop professing. Because it doesn't appear, at least in the moment, that you are possessing any fear of the Lord. But you are professing fear of the Lord. We can find ourselves professing fear of the Lord while it does not appear at all that we possess fear of the Lord. That's where Jonah is. He is saying, I believe this God. I trust this God. I'm just running away from this God. <laughs> It's, the incongruency is ironic, and yet, here are the mariners, the heathen mariners, right? They were worshiping other gods just a few moments ago, and they're afraid. You see, who really has fear of the Lord, right? And the mariners then seek to obey the Lord. Page flipped over here. Verse 11, and they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Do you notice that right away? It's like, what do we need to do? Jonah, you're, you're the prophet, you're the Hebrew, you're the one that has worshipped this God for a long time. Tell us what we need to do. They want to obey. You see that? They want to get themselves right with this God. So tell us what we need to do. While Jonah is continuing in his disobedience, seeking to escape the Lord. They're seeking to obey, and he's seeking to escape. Because what is his response? He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. If I was one of the mariners, I might have rushed by and just thrown them overboard right there. (laughs) Like, you, you know this is why the tempest has come? Jonah knew the whole time. You know it's because of you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm throwing him in the sea. (laughs) Absolutely. But what is Jonah trying to do? 
You see, notice what Jonah does not do. What is Jonah in the activity of doing right now? He's running away from the Lord. He's trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. Correct? Right? Am I accurate in that? Okay. And Jonah says, throw me into the sea. Let me tell you, if you are running away from the Lord, the solution is not to let somebody kill you. What is the solution? You repent. You turn and you run back to the Lord. And by the way, you don't have to run. The Lord followed you. <laughs> and so there's an old song that says, they say you've walked 10,000 steps away. But you know what? It's only one step back. Turn around. God's right there. But Jonah does not turn. He says, throw me into the sea. Kill me. Put me to death. He's trying to escape the responsibility God has placed on him to go to Nineveh. The mariner's response to that, as opposed to probably what my response would have been, <laughs> I can't wait to get this guy in the sea. <laughs> I mean, you're endangering our lives. Nevertheless, verse 13, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, because, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. They don't throw them into the sea, do they? They're like, you worship the God of heaven, the one who made the land and the sea. You are a Hebrew that worships this God. We need to treat your life as valuable. Right? They valued Jonah's life so much so Remember, earlier in the text, we find out the ship was about to break apart. This storm is already vicious. They know they're in peril. They are scared to death. I tell you what, again, I'll go back and say, if it were me, hey, let's try it. <laughs> let's just toss them, see what happens, right? <laughs> and that would be me. And these guys are like, no. This God who brings this storm, we do not want him angry with us. We are not going to toss this guy over if that's who he worships. We need to do everything we can to save him. And they value his life. Meanwhile, Jonah does not value human life. He disregards human life. And look at this in a bigger picture way. Because we could think Jonah disregards his own life, right? Like, throw me overboard. Let me die. And he does. He does disregard his own life. But what about the lives of the mariners? They're in peril. Does Jonah jump over the side to say, okay, I'll just jump and save their lives. I'll give my life. He doesn't willingly give his life. He tells them they can throw him overboard, but he doesn't jump, does he? He doesn't care about them. It's like Jonah's sitting there going, You can throw me overboard if you want. That's probably going to stop this thing. And he just stares at him like, and they try to save his life, and he just sits there like, okay. And he knows at any point he could say, God, all right, I give up. I will, I will go to Nineveh. Do you think God would have ceased the storm at that point? I do. I think God would have said, that's what I was looking for, but God doesn't. Right? Because Jonah doesn't. And Jonah continues in his belligerence and his disobedience, not caring about these men. And worse, or maybe not worse, but just as bad. He's still saying, and I don't care if the Ninevites die and go to hell. He hates, doesn't he? He doesn't care about the lives of the mariners, the lives of the Ninevites. This is bad news, isn't it? So Jonah disregards human life while the mariners, Jonah being the prophet of God, he should be the one who knows what God would desire. And the mariners go, I think God would desire us to preserve human life. Amazing how the mariners know what God wants as opposed to the prophet of God who does not care what God wants. Then we see the mariners call out to the Lord. After they rode hard, you see in verse 14, Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. They cry out to the Lord, Lord, 
we feel like we're in a pickle here. <laughs> we, we value this man's life, and we, but we, we also feel like we don't have a choice here. And, and we believe what we're about to do is what you want. But they don't do it without asking him, without going to him and pleading with him. Like, give, give him a little more time. Like, maybe, maybe this isn't what he wants. Maybe he'll reveal another path, right? They're like, okay, this is what we need to do. And they call out to the Lord, and this is as opposed to Jonah. Remember last week where we left Jonah? Captain comes down underneath the ship. He says, wake up, you sleeper, right? Wake up. He says, cry out to your God. Perhaps he will save us. You ever see Jonah cry out to God so far? Not once. Jonah doesn't even go to God and say, God, I know you want something different from me than what I'm doing, and I don't want to obey you, but at least save the mariners. No, he doesn't even cry out at all on behalf of the mariners. He doesn't ask, Why? Because he's running from God. You ever cry out to God when you're running from him? No, you don't. Right? When we're trying to run from God, we don't cry out to him. We're trying to run. Jonah's trying to run. He refuses to cry out to God. He refuses to even speak to the Lord. The prophet of God. Now, when we think of prophecy, what we need to understand is they were there to declare the word of the Lord. And the prophet of God, the one God has called to declare his own word, won't even talk to God. Wow. This is some serious hatred in his heart. Then we see that the mariners submit to the Lord. They say, we're going to, because that last phrase, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. They aren't throwing Jonah overboard to save their own skin. They're throwing Jonah overboard because they believe it's what God wants them to do. They, were, they would have been pleased to be able to save Jonah's life by getting to land, right? That's why they rode so hard. But instead, they say, okay, we're going to submit to you, God. We're going to do what we believe pleases you. And so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. I think about that, the sea ceasing from its raging. And it, and it makes me think of Jesus and his disciples. They're out in a storm, right? On the boat. The storm's going crazy. And the disciples are scared to death. They are fearful, right? They don't know what's going to happen next. And they look at Jesus and say, help us, you know. And what does Jesus say? Peace. Be still. And what happens? <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Stillness happens. And what did, how did the disciples respond? Who is this? That even the, the wind and the waves obey him? Who, who is this? You think they went back and thought of Jonah? This happened once before. This happened to Jonah. The wind ceased, and who hurled that wind? God did. Who ceased that wind? God did. Who is Jesus? Oh, Jesus is God. He is God. I had somebody this week challenge me on that. He said, I used to be a Trinitarian Christian, now I'm a Unitarian Christian. And so I don't believe Jesus is God. I didn't engage in debate with him. I just said, you're wrong. And I'm, this is me shaking the dust off my feet. You're wrong. Jesus is God. It is all the book of John. My goodness. How can you go into the book of John and not see Jesus is God? If anyone shows up at your door someday and they try to teach you something, it sounds a little goofy, one good question to ask them is, is Jesus God? And if they say, well... He's a God. Shake the dust off your feet. Send him away. I had a Jehovah's Witness show up at my door back in Wisconsin the last winter we were there. And uh, he got out of his car. It was icy as could be. It was raining. <laughs> we stood in the rain and talked for a little bit. 
I shared the gospel with him. And uh, then I wished him a good day because I didn't let him share much with me at all because I don't need to hear it. He needed to hear it, right? He needed the gospel. I shared that with him. And then I said, I hope you have a good day. I said, except I hope your proselytizing falls on his face because you're preaching a false gospel. And I, I mean, I smiled at him, said goodbye. You know, I was not mean. I was not a jerk, but I was honest with him. I don't hope that you have a good day in the sense like you make converts. I hope you fail in that. And I hope when you rest your head on the pillow tonight that you think about what I've shared with you. And I just left it at that. That's the way we need to be, right? Jesus is God. If he's not, then the payment that he made for sin is worthless. And we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. We have no hope. Jesus is God. And I, I, think, I think that connection to Jonah, to when Jesus calmed the storm, is no coincidence that we're talking about that this morning, that God wants to show us, my son is God. So the, the, the mariners, they submit to the Lord while Jonah remains disobedient, right? Jonah hits the water, still a disobedient, rebellious prophet. He, he doesn't hit the water as a repentant man. He hits as a rebellious man, still refusing to turn to God. Then we see, lastly, that the mariners are transformed by the storm. The men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They feared God exceedingly. It's interesting. Jonah said, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made land and sea. Right? That's what Jonah said. And here, the mariners are the ones who fear the Lord. The former heathens. I believe these men were converted. I believe these men believed God and it was credited them for righteousness. I believe someday we can get to talk to the mariners in heaven. I believe that. That we'll be able to ask them, give me your perspective on that storm. and have them hear. I would love to hear that story, wouldn't you, from their perspective. I believe we'll get that opportunity because... They made vows and they sacrificed to the Lord. Now you say, you can make vows and not be converted. I understand that, but why would the text say that? These men were transformed by this experience and God used it to bring them to himself. And they were transformed through the storm. While Jonah remained stubborn, didn't he? Jonah just remained stubborn through the whole thing. He refuses to change. He refuses to change. But these men are change. And you know what? Think about this. If you don't think they were changed because you think, well, maybe they just made some vows and sacrifices on the ship and then they just kept going. No. Where'd the cargo go? Where was the cargo? Tossed it over, right? There's no cargo left. What'd they make sacrifices and vows with? <laughs> they had to wait till they got to land. This is once they finally got to land, they made sacrifice and vows. This doesn't seem to be a momentary, just a momentary conversion. No, this seems to be a lasting conversion in their lives. They make sacrifices and vows. And I believe these men are converted and we'll see them in glory someday. But Jonah remains stubborn during the storm. Okay, so that's our text for this morning. So what does Israel learn that we need to learn today? I believe, first of all, that God is God. God's God. And, and that may seem like a very simple statement, but that statement has a lot in it. Because here's, here's the thing. You know, you see in this text how God hurls the storm, right? And, and how God has a ship almost break apart, and then he makes the storm worse. And, and you can go forward, and you can see how God appoints a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and how God has that fish spit him out on land, right? You can see how God works through all of this. And we must recognize his sovereignty, that God is sovereign. And you know when it reveals to me that I don't recognize his sovereignty is when something comes into my life, maybe it's a storm, comes into my life, and I panic. You ever been there? <laughs> what am I going to do with this? Where am I going to go? Well, how's this going to turn out? And I panic. And in that moment, I've realized 
even looking at the sovereignty of God. I'm forgetting that God is God. I love what my wife learned a while back, and she shares this once in a while. But she'll say that, that, that a storm comes into somebody's life, and the first thing they'll do is we'll cry out to God, right? God, take this storm from me. And my wife says, sometimes I think God's looking at us going, I just gave it to you, right? <laughs> I just brought this storm into your life. This is a gift from me. God brings those things into our lives. Who hurled the wind? God did. Who's in charge here? God is. And as Israel kept thinking, I can serve this God too, maybe this God will help me out, and God is speaking clearly to them saying, those other gods you're worshiping, they're nothing. They can't do what I'm doing. I am God, and I am God alone. And for the church, we ought to learn that more clearly. The sovereignty of God. He is in control. And I think the modern day church is weak on that. I really do. I think we all are weak at moments, aren't we? Every one of us become weak on that. And we need to be reminded constantly, no, God is in control. He knows what he is doing. He is sovereign over it all. Also, God does not need the Israelites or their willingness. Remember, I, I'm telling you that earlier that the Israelites believed, hey, we're important. God chose us because he needs us. <laughs> no, he don't. <laughs> he doesn't need you, and he does not need your willingness. Why? How do I know that? Because look at Jonah. Was Jonah willing to go share the gospel? No. <laughs> He's like, I hate those Ninevites. I'm not going. I'm not going to share your message of compassion. So he runs the other way. And he gets on this ship with a bunch of heathens who don't know God. And does he say, hey, let me see if I can give the gospel to these guys or talk about Yahweh with these men? No, that's not on his heart. He goes down and sleeps, right? And the only thing he does through this whole experience at one point is profess some fear of the Lord. But if we were as a church to look at this, we'd say, what a poor testimony, wouldn't we? I mean, he's not living for the Lord. No way God would use that. He can't use him. Disobedient, rebellious, and what does God do? He saves the mariners. <laughs> what a poor testimony. God didn't need Jonah to save the mariners. He didn't need Jonah to save the Ninevites. God chose him. And even in Jonah's rebellion and disobedience, God chose to save. He didn't need his willingness, did he? This, goes, this ties well with the sovereignty of God. Find yourself in rebellion. You should repent, but here's the thing you need to remember is God will use that too. God uses the sin of people sinlessly to accomplish his purposes. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your obedience. Right? He doesn't need anything. He is self-sufficient. God, I mean, there's songs out there that talk about like, well, he, he needed a little, a little love or he needed people to be with him in heaven or what. No, he didn't. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Jesus, existing in eternity past, could have continued to exist in the eternity future and been just fine without us. He chose to do this. He chose to do so. He does not need. And then God will use his people willingly or defiantly. <laughs> I mean, Jonah's so defiant, and God still used him to save these mariners. Isn't that I want to tell you this morning, that should give you comfort if you have been running from the Lord or if you have, can remember a time and you feel guilty about running from the Lord. That you ought to rest in the fact, you know what, God even uses my defiance. God even uses my defiance. That doesn't mean we go be more defiant. <laughs> but God uses it. Some of us have a past where we were defiant and we think, 
What a waste of my life. I've heard, I don't know how many people I've heard that come to, especially come to Christ later in life, or that come to Christ early, maybe walk away and, and don't live that lifestyle and come back, and they say, what a waste of my life. And I think, no, 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 no. You see, see so you may be looking at your life and say, I'm worthless. I'm throwaway. And, and, and in a sense, I could agree with you, except for what you're not doing is looking at who God is and what a great God we have. That he can take worthless and throw away and use it for majestic purposes. That we need to get the eyes off of ourselves and our worthlessness and get our eyes on the King, the Majesty, the Almighty that does amazing things and his glory and who he is. That's the whole problem. You got your eyes on yourself. Get your eyes off yourself. Look at how awesome he is. That's what happens when we run. Our eyes are fixed on the wrong place, right? We can't run away from God and have our eyes fixed on Jesus, right? We have to have our eyes fixed on Jesus to have our thinking corrected. He uses people willingly or defiantly. And then lastly, I hope we all revel in this. God loves to transform sinners. God loves that. He delights to take a rotten sinner and make them walk holy and blameless before him. He loves doing that. We've seen, I hope everyone in here can say, I revel in that. I love that because he took this rotten sinner, right? He took this rotten sinner and he's transforming him into the image of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that God transforms sinners through the blood of Jesus Christ and makes us walk holy and blameless before him. We were in Sunday school this morning and someone shared about someone they shared the gospel with and, and the way they described it was something to the effect of this person really needs the gospel. <laughs> you know, like they're really bad, right? And the reality is, we, we, I, I, we, as we talked about that, I'm like, you know, we just don't recognize how bad we are, do we? How we need transformation. And we do, right? Where were you when God found you? Talk about being found by Jesus and following Jesus, right? Where were you when Jesus found you? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You could do nothing. You needed transformation, right? You needed resurrection, and he gave that to you. He, he delights in doing so. So why did the Israelites not delight in that and seeing that and God do that? You see, that's, that's the rub here. Jonah represents Israel. And Israel had no compassion for the lost. Jonah hated the Ninevites so badly that he's like, let them die and go to hell. I don't care. And by the way, he's still there. See, the book of Jonah is about the compassion of God. God has a purpose of showing his compassion, his mercy. He has shown it to his church, hasn't he? Hasn't he? Has he shown his compassion to you? He has. So as a church, let us pray consistently that the Lord would increase our compassion for the lost. You see, I, I could have and I thought of, maybe I have people make a list, right, of, of who you know that's lost. And you say, okay, I'm going to make a list and I'm going I'm to try to share the gospel with one of these people in the next two weeks or something. I, I could have done something like that. But I realize some of us and, and often all of us probably at different points have the same problem Jonah had. It's, 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 it's not that we don't want to see salvation. It's that we don't truly have compassion for the lost. We don't truly care. I mean, we care. We love to see people saved, right? But do we care enough to share, right? Do, do, we, do we care enough to pursue it? And I realize I have a motivational problem. When I became pastor here a year ago, I was reading a Spurgeon book, 
And, and he said something that just cut me to the quick, and it said something to the effect of, if you don't have a burden for the lost as a pastor, then you need to find something else to do with your life. And that cut me deep. Because I'm like, do I have a burden for the lost people of Norton and Barberton and of Wadsworth and Copley and Akron? Do I have a, a burden for them? I mean, I, I like to see them saved. But do I have the compassion of God in my life that he has towards these people? Look at what God did here, taking Jonah. And, and, and when God gave Jonah the command, he knew he was going to disobey, right? And he, he, he has Jonah go this way when, when he's supposed to go that way, and he uses that, and he saves these mariners, and now he's going to have Jonah still go to Nineveh, and he's going to save a whole city because he loves to transform sinners. And if I had the compassion of God in my life, for the lost, I would love to see sinners transformed too. So much so that it would impact my activity. And so here's what I'm asking us to do as a church. I'm not asking you to make a list of people and say, I'm going to go share the gospel with these people. You can do that. I mean, I'm not going to stop you. If the Holy Spirit speaks that, do it, okay? What I'm going to ask us to do is pray and beg God to give us compassion for the lost. The Bible says if we go to him and we ask for bread as his children, would he give us a stone? If we pray that way, God's going to give us compassion for the lost. And my friends, if we had compassion for the lost, I probably wouldn't let many days go by before I looked at my neighbor when I had a chance to talk to him and said, i got to tell you about something. Right? Because I'd care so deeply for them. I would let anything interrupt my day so that I could share the gospel with someone who's, who's dying and going to hell. Right? I would let anything interrupt my day if I had compassion for the lost. And so all I'm asking us to do is as a church, in the coming weeks, months, just pray that God would give us a heart of compassion for the lost. I don't have to worry about what you'll do if you pray that prayer. God will move in your circumstances. You will begin to see opportunities that you would have walked past before because God will put that heart of compassion in you. Because you're asking for bread, he's going to give you bread. Can we commit to that together? To pray that God would increase our compassion for the lost. Let's begin right now. Father, I confess, I think it always starts there, and I confessed it earlier today as well, but that I have not had the compassion that I need. I've not had your compassion for the lost. While I'm thankful to see people go from darkness to light, I'm amazed that you, when you do that. But Father, my, my burden is not the same as yours yet. And so, Father, I, I ask for forgiveness for that, but I also ask that you would increase our burden here, my burden personally. For those who do not yet know of salvation, that do not have their sins forgiven, that are not made right with you, reconciled, that are still enemies with you, still dead in their trespasses and sins. Father, may we see people not as, as, as people who we do business with or, or people we just converse with. May we see them as you see them, as those who are bound for judgment and need to know the truth. And may we care. So grow that compassion in our hearts. Change us, transform us to have the compassion Jesus had when he looked at the world around him. That we may care more about their spiritual needs than anything else. And Father, I trust through that you will, as you transform us, as you grant that, as you give us this bread today, that you'll open our eyes to what we can do with that compassion. You'll give us places to, to, to funnel that compassion to. I just trust you with that, so we just today are praying for that compassion. Thank you so much that you will do it because you love us, because you desire to give your children good gifts. We are so thankful that we can pray this in faith, knowing we will receive it from you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the one who died so that we could have this opportunity to know your compassion. It's his great name that we pray. Amen.